in one of the five ways. So the first is race, right? So when we're talking about pers the act of persecution, race. And uh, I'll read exactly what's here, it's very short. Race is used in the broadest sense of, in the broadest sense, and includes ethnic groups, social groups of common descent. Okay. Number two is religion. Right? Religion, quote, has a broad meaning, including identification with a group that tends to share common traditions or beliefs, as well as the act of practice of religion. Practice in religion, insofar as my, it's a religious conflict, insofar as my religion does not conform to those in power, and I refuse to change or, you know, transform my religious beliefs, I am targeted for persecution. That persecution then le legitimizes my right to seek asylum, which then creates a corresponding obligation from the host nation. Number three, nationality. This one's a bit more complicated. Nationality. I actually want to read this. Nationality obviously includes an individual's citizenship, lack of citizenship, or former citizenship. In many parts of the world, um, though, nationality refers not to formal citizenship, but to language, culture, right? So when we're talking about nationality, it's important that you don't um, construe nationality simply to mean just sort of citizenship in this rather obvious sense. But when we're talking about nationality, we're also talking about, and did I put this in the notes? Yeah, I did. Um, so I won't write it write down too much, but we would also mean language, culture, and so on, right? Language, culture, ethnic background um, of a group. For these reasons, persecution of ethnic, linguistic, and cultural groups within a population may also be deemed persecution based on nationality, right? So when we're talking about national persecution of a targeted population, um, we don't just mean sort of this general nationality in the sense of citizenship. Um, it could be socio-cultural, linguistic, what have you. Okay? Next is persecution based on a particular social group, right? A particular social group. Number four. Social grouping. What does that look like? Um, I'll just read this, this whole section because it's a, an important part. A particular social group refers to people who share a similar background, habit, or social status. This category often overlaps with persecution based on one of the four grounds. It has been applied to families of capitalists, landowners, entrepreneurs, former members of military, students, tribal groups, I mean you name it, um, individuals who violate the caste system. Recently, some refugee authorities have recognized certain groups defined by gender and or sexual orientation as prosecuted social, uh, as, uh, sorry, pro, uh, protected social groupings. So as I said before, um, we might target uh, a population uh, based on gender. We might target a population based on um, sexual orientation. All of these groups are military, um, student populations. I, obviously, in, in um, the, the Khmer Rouge genocide, uh, it was specifically sort of, and also, you know, the, the, uh, the, the slaughter that happened in Rwanda as well, a lot of it uh, initially began with um, the targeted and strategic extermination of uh, people from the intelligentsia, educators, teachers, professors, strategically. I mean, in, in Khmer Rouge, it got so ridiculous that you were you you could be targeted for extermination for just wearing a pair of glasses, right? Because you know eyeglasses were considered to be, you know, in some bizarre sense, uh, part of the sort of bourgeois capitalist indoctrination, what have you, blah blah blah, right? So this this social grouping is obviously a very sort of gray area and for almost any reason you think of individuals could be targeted for um, extermination. Number five, lastly, uh, political opinion. Political opinion, I'll read this last bit, um, refers to ideas not tolerated by the authorities including opinions critical to government policies and methods primarily an authoritarian, totalitarian, fascist sort of state. Fascist state is not going to allow or entertain challenges to the state, the power. Power has been hegemonized, right? And insofar as power is hegemonized, any sort of rhetoric that critiques the hegemony then becomes sort of rhetoric from enemy of the state mentality, right? So that 
if you challenge the state of any accord, then you are immediately an enemy of the state. And insofar as you're an enemy of the state, right, you're then um, persecuted. Uh, and usually that persecution immediately goes to extermination, right? Persecution is sort of, persecution almost immediately, historically, evolves overnight into targeted and strategic extermination, typically of uh, members of elite social class, landowners and property owners and stuff, and then uh, intelligentsia, right? Um, so that that condition allows, and what I what I wrote here specifically was refers to the ideas not tolerated, right, by authorities, including critical um, opinions of government policies and methods. I forgot to read the last bit. Um, it includes opinions attributed to an individual by the authority, even if the individual does not, in fact, hold that opinion. There, I, I, you know, if I would have had it, I would have put it in. Um, I would have put it in my notes. My one of my favorite, one of my favorite sort of block quotes of all time comes from Hannah Arendt's totalitarianism, where she talks about sort of um, the role of the Bolsheviks. And there's there's something along the lines of I, I forget. I, I need to really memorize it. It was like if you are not an enemy of the state, you have to recognize that the state needs you to be an enemy right now because the state, as a totalitarian state, is defined by an enemy. So we need somebody to kill. And unfortunately, if you are the bad guy or not, we want you to play the role of the bad guy so we can legitimize your extermination. Right? Uh, I have the quote in another one of my lecture series. I'll, if I can remember, I'll see if I can find Well, no, it'll throw off my page. My page, sort of, I may put a link to it. Um, but yeah, it's a genius quote from Arendt's uh, totalitarianism. It's, just, it's, a, it's amazing, right? So even if the individual doesn't, support or ascribe the particular belief that the political regime is saying that you support insofar as the political regime has the power it's going to need in order to sort of legitimize the the um, the uh, the war state it's going to need somebody to be the bad guy so you're unfortunately your population has been um, selected to, to be the bad guy and now we're going to have to uh, you know lock you up and kill you so that becomes problematic Okay, so what we've seen, uh, there's just one last point and then I'll wrap this up, but what we've seen is that insofar as we're attempting to recognize um, sort of the role and the complications in actually being a refugee, right, and being forced to, one, um, endure persecution, and having to then, to flee from that persecution, and you, as I told you in, it wasn't in this section, in the last section, maybe an hour ago in the discussion, about an example I heard on NPR, I forget where the conflict was, but the mother had, uh, her husband was massacred in a battle, it was her and her three kids, she had to walk some hundred miles to go to a host nation, um, two of her children were sick, the weaker of the two child she selected to leave on the road, and she left the child on the road and, you know, and, and took the other two uh, who were stronger and healthier to survive. Brutal. So just think about that, right? Just think about just the trek in itself, the act, the process of seeking asylum. It's not just this conceptual word, word or phrase where the, uh, the refugee, the internally displaced person has the right to seek asylum. That act of seeking asylum is a physical trek. You know, it's, a, it's an arduous journey to get from point A to point B. Only then to arrive and point B to recognize that you might be in a host nation that doesn't really want to accommodate our refugee population in worst case scenario. And you immediately have to understand the layout of the land and who's friend and foe and, 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 and then just being displaced, right, amongst your people. And you might be in a population of people who are ethnically different from you. The language might be displaced. You all might be um, homogeneously uh, members of an internally displaced group of people, but you might not ethnically be the same, so that you might not be able to talk to people. Um, you might have different cultural and religious beliefs from people, so that the idea that within um, a community of internally displaced refugees, that their solidarity is ridiculous, right? They're, no. They're, when you get to the refugee camp, even within the camp, of internally displaced people, um, religious conflict, gender-based conflict, biases, um, socio-cultural conflict arise, not to mention the state. So it's, it's, it's just a constant arduous process of having to 
attempt to survive. And I think it's a wonderful thing that more people are, are you know, just discussing and trying to make sense of uh, internally displaced persons because it's going to become not just a burden on sort of the host nation, the more we become a global, a global community, not just a global economy, but a global community, internally displaced persons and refugees present a challenge for us collectively. Right? It becomes uh, a collective responsibility. And on a side, I've done some research on collective sympathy, not going to get into it now, but there is a sense in which if donor fatigue and, and um, compassion fatigue sets in based on the host nation, other nations internationally need to reinforce and support whoever that host nation might be, both financially and in whatever way it can, by maybe NGO affiliation, what have you, um, in order to bolster the community of internally displaced persons to either get back home or to become productive, pr productive members of society within the host nation, right? But that's not just my argument, at least, and I, I very rarely ever show my bias, but my argument is, at least, that the, the right is legitimized, the burden as being host nation only specific, problematic. Right? I think it's globally specific. Globally, we have the obligation, and whoever the host nation is sh should receive some, some, at least my idea is, uh, some international um, contribution, both financially and intellectually, to um, transition the um, refugee and IDP group into functioning members of society, what have you. Um, you know, I'm just throwing it out there. Difficult thing to actually bring into existence, but hopefully, you know, the discussion starts and this is where ideas get generated, so I'm sort of a source of generating ideas. <laughs> That's what I do for a living. So, with that, uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my video. I think that concludes the um, refugee, yeah, that concludes the, the uh, section on human rights and um, internally displaced people, uh, internally displaced persons, refugees. Hopefully you have a better understanding of sort of strategically, conceptually, the process of becoming a refugee and the rights and obligations that correspond to uh, refugee status, both internally, internationally, uh, and the means of defending those rights. So with that, I um, want to thank you for watching the videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.